Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. August 31st, 1977. Janet knocked loudly on the bathroom door. Hurry up, she called out. The door burst open and Billy and Johnny came barreling through, nearly knocking her to the ground, laughing as they ran to their bedroom. Margaret shouldered her way past Janet and grabbed her toothbrush, kicking the door closed behind her. Janet opened the door. Very funny, as she hip-checked her sister playfully. It was bedtime at the Hodgson house. Margaret turned off the lights and made her way towards her bed. Leave the door open a bit, it's too dark, Janet called out to Margaret before she hopped into bed. She cracked the bedroom door open just a few inches, allowing a bit of light from the hallway to seep through. As the two sisters drifted off to sleep, a chill passed through the bedroom. Janet looked over at Margaret nervously, but she was already fast asleep. She wouldn't be sleeping long before the two were startled by the sound of the dresser shuffling around. The shuffling quickly turned to violent shaking and pounding against the wall. Margaret and Janet sat straight up, shocked. They were too afraid to say anything and just stared at the chest of drawers as it continued to shake and bang against the wall. Then suddenly, it stopped. Their trance-like state was broken when the sound of footsteps began pounding up the stairs. Their bedroom door shot open and in came their mother. I want you two to pack it up and stop fighting. If I have any more of it, I'll have you separated, she said angrily. The sisters immediately started yelling over each other, explaining to their mother that the dresser was moving on its own, and they had both been in bed all night. Peggy stood there for a moment in disbelief with her arms folded. She looked at the girls, then at the chest of drawers, then back at the girls. Right then, let's have a look and see. Peggy pulled up a chair to the side of Margaret's bed and sat down facing the dresser, waiting to debunk this nonsense. Just then, the dresser slid forward across the floor towards her. Puzzled, Peggy stood up and slid it back up against the wall. Before she even made it back to her chair, the dresser began to rock back and forth, and then it slid towards her again. Peggy let out a gasp and then got to her feet and attempted to push the dresser back. But this time, it wouldn't budge. She stood back, the blood draining from her face as her heart sank into her stomach. Something wasn't right. She turned back to look at her frightened daughters. Peggy opened her mouth to speak, but she was interrupted when three loud knocks slammed against the wall. All three of them started screaming and scrambled out of the room. I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Enfield Poltergeist. In August of 1977, a quiet North London suburb would be disturbed by strange and unusual poltergeist activity. For months, these events turned more and more violent and would be verified and witnessed by dozens of terrified locals, BBC journalists, police, and experts. It all started one summer night when Janet and Margaret Hodgson witnessed a chest of drawers moving on its own. When Peggy came in to see what all the ruckus was about, she too witnessed the dresser moving on its own. Everyone in the home heard strange noises, bumps, and knocks around the house all night. The following day, Peggy was exhausted and she was an emotional wreck. She did her best to hold it all together, and as the sun set, she took her children to the neighbor's house. Vic Nottingham answered the door and listened to their story. Vic was a large man and not a believer in the paranormal. The Nottinghams let the family inside, and Vic took a stroll next door to see what was going on for himself. As he made his way upstairs, he too heard knocking on the wall and couldn't figure out what the source was. He made his way into the boy's bedroom, and again, he heard the knocking. As he passed from bedroom to bedroom, the knocking seemed to be following him. Now Vic was a builder by trade, and he knew the difference between the sounds of pipes or other noises that should be normal within a house. This 
was not normal. Vic was baffled and scared and couldn't do much to comfort the Hodgesons. Without knowing what else to do, Peggy called the police. When the police arrived, they were a bit taken back by the story about dressers moving on their own and strange knocks. They figured with four children in the house, it was likely a prank, but the officers agreed to have a look around anyways. The officers split up. One made his way upstairs to have a look around, while the other stayed downstairs to get the full story from Vic. As she took notes, the wooden chair next to them lifted into the air and moved across the room on its own. The officer and Vic stood there for a moment, puzzled. Officer Carolyn Heaps said, quote, The chair lifted up, maybe a half inch off the floor, and I saw it slide to the right, three and a half to four feet before it came to rest. She immediately attempted to debunk what the two of them just saw. Carolyn placed a marble on the floor to see if it would roll in the same direction, but it didn't move. She checked for wires under the chair or anything that could have caused it to move, but found nothing. The officers stayed for over an hour, searching the property for pranksters or any source of these strange happenings. They couldn't explain what was going on and told the family it was basically out of their hands. That night, the knockings grew louder. Objects moved on their own and beds began to shake. Pictures fell from the walls and the terrified family huddled together on the living room floor. On September 4th, 1977, without knowing what else to do, Vic and Peggy both made frantic calls to the press. They contacted the Daily Mirror and explained that not only did the entire family witness these hauntings, but so did the neighbors and even the police. Graham Morris, a photographer for the newspaper, and Douglas Bentz, a reporter for the Daily Mirror, drove out to the house. When they entered the home, Peggy was a wreck. Without knowing what to expect, they set up cameras and microphones and waited to see what would happen. But nothing happened. They sat around with cameras rolling, then sat down and had a cup of tea. After a few hours, they called it a night. As they were loading equipment into their car, Vic came running out of the house towards them. He rushed over and let them know that it was starting again. As they all ran back into the house, they immediately witnessed objects flying all over the living room. According to Douglas, he couldn't tell where these items were coming from, but they were certainly not being thrown by the children or Peggy. Legos and marbles were bouncing off of the walls, one of them striking Morris in the forehead. The Lego was traveling so fast that it left a mark on his head that lasted for a few days. The attack became so violent that as a precaution, they began to stash knives and more dangerous items into drawers to avoid being killed by a more lethal object. The two waited for things to calm down, then left to write their report. What was frustrating for the pair was when the photos of that night were developed, they failed to capture any real evidence of what everyone witnessed. The pictures showed pure terror on everyone's faces, but no clear pictures of anything levitating or flying across the room. To this day, Morris and Benz claim that what they saw that night was true poltergeist activity. Worried about the safety of the family, the journalists reached out to professionals for help. They contacted the Society for Psychical Research, the SPR, and the man who responded to the case was Morris Gross, who was an inventor who joined the SPR after the death of his daughter. He didn't know what to expect when he arrived at Green Street. He kept an open mind, but knew there was a strong possibility that this could all be a hoax. As soon as he entered the house, the first thing that he noticed was that everybody was extremely disturbed. The children were disturbed. The mother was disturbed. The reporters were disturbed. And the neighbors were disturbed. What Gross found particularly interesting was that the mother and the children seemed to have no idea what a poltergeist was. After spending a few nights at the home, Morris was convinced that something was going on. He witnessed objects moved on their own and noticed some of the children would fall into trance-like states. Feeling that he was in over his head, he reached out to Guy Lyon Playfair, who was a paranormal investigator and journalist, for help. Convinced that they were dealing with a genuine poltergeist, the two moved into the home. The coverage from the Daily Mirror eventually attracted the attention of BBC Radio, who sent a reporter to the house. Roz Morris arrived and got the full story from Graham. The first night she was there, they heard a noise from the girl's bedroom. When they went upstairs, the two girls were asleep, but a chair appeared to have been flipped over and one of the beds had been moved. She described it as an unnerving experience. The children did not appear to be faking their sleep. 
In October 1977, activity at the house on Green Street took a dark turn. The entire family had moved their beds downstairs into the living room for their own safety. Janet began hearing a scraping sound coming from the fireplace next to her bed. Suddenly, there was a loud vibrating sound, which Playfair described as the sound of someone drilling a hole into the side of the house. The fireplace shook violently, and the front of the fireplace lifted up and was pulled up over the bed, bending the pipe that was attached to the gas fire. The object was described as so heavy that the adults couldn't even lift it up, let alone a child. The pipe was bent and was still attached, and prevented the object from moving any further. Experts started to believe that Janet may have been the source of this energy, and felt that the poltergeist may have attached itself to her, feeding off of her energy. Noises and knocks continued to haunt the family. When they would approach the sound of these noises, it would bounce to another part of the room. It seemed to almost be toying with them. During an interview with Stuart Lamont, who visited the home to get the story from Janet and Margaret, he captured some of this thumping during the interview. As he was asking the girls about when the phenomena began, they all heard three loud knocks. Lamont maintained that it couldn't have been anyone in the house, and he believes that what he captured during that interview was something otherworldly making its presence known. The disturbances continued to get worse, and the family had reached their wits end. Gross and Morris sent the family on vacation to give them a break from the chaos. But this was only a temporary pause on the inevitable nightmare awaiting them when they returned. When the Hodgsons got back to their house, the activity intensified. Beds shook. Sheets were pulled from sleeping children. Gross stepped in and tried to communicate with whatever was haunting the house. He recorded over 50 knocks on tape in response to his questioning. Frustrated, he asked the poltergeist, Are you having a game with me? Just then, a cardboard box from the corner of the room levitated off the ground and went flying at him, hitting him in the head and knocking him back. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you having a game with me? Oh, oh right. Oh, gross. Oh. As I ask the, as oh, I ask the question, are you having a game you? with me? It threw, it threw the, the cardboard box <laughs> and the pillow right at my face. Oh, well, thank you very much. That was a very good answer. Gross was convinced that this case was genuine, but other members of the SBR who visited the house weren't so convinced. They claimed that the entire situation was a hoax being put on by the children. In November 1977, Janet began making disturbing drawings. She also started sleepwalking and having epileptic fits, where she would temporarily have what was described as supernatural strength. She would run at full speed, head first into walls, and the family was growing more concerned about her safety. She became more angry, screaming, and swearing more frequently. Later in November, the poltergeist activity hit its peak. Janet's bed flipped completely over, leaving her trapped underneath. Peggy ran into the room and was horrified at what she saw. Enough was enough. She left a pad and pen in the room and demanded to know what was going on. In the morning, a message was scribbled across the pad that read, quote, I will stay in this house. Do not read this to anyone, or I will retaliate. On November 22nd, Janet was injected with Valium by a doctor to sedate her. She was found on top of a dresser, laying upside down across a radio, with one leg in the air and her head hanging over the edge. Her condition worsened. In one instance, she was dragged out of bed by an unseen force. The bedroom door opened on its own, and she was pulled into the hallway and sent toppling down the stairs. During a state of hypnosis, she recalled the event to a psychiatrist, saying that in that moment, she felt cold hands around her ankles, pulling her out of bed. Jay! Tell me what happened. I was in bed asleep. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I felt something pull me by the arms out of bed. And I tripped over there, and I went there. Yeah. And it lifted me up. And I saw the door opened, and I went out the door, and I come flying downstairs. And I said, Cameras set up in the bedroom capture her being launched into the air or levitating. On December 14, 1977, a bread delivery man heard a massive commotion coming from the house. As he looked into the window, he witnessed Janet floating around in a circular motion 
being followed by toys and books. Another witness, Hazel, claims she saw Janet through the bedroom window around the same time, laying flat, horizontal, and levitating up and down as if something had her arms and legs and were lifting her off the ground. The next twist would be the most controversial. A dog was heard barking inside the house, but there was no dog. It was at that moment when they decided to set up a microphone, because if it could bark, maybe it could talk. Morris challenged whatever it was to talk, and again, on the recording, you hear a dog bark. Then the barking stopped, and the raspy voice of an old man came through, calling him by name. It no longer sounded like a dog, and it certainly sounded nothing like an 11-year-old girl. I want you to call out my name. It's my complete name. Morris Christ. See if you can do that. Come on, my name's Morris. Let me hear you say it. Morris. Janet felt that this voice was speaking through her. Rosalind from BBC Radio heard about this unfolding development in the case and went to see if she too could communicate with this poltergeist. The voice started making jokes and began communicating with others as well. When asked where he sleeps, he claimed that he, quote, sleeps on top of Janet. When they asked why, the voice claimed that, quote, it's my bed. The voice seemed to be self-aware that he was a ghost, claiming that he was invisible, even spelling out the word ghost. Why can't Janet sue you? I'm invisible. You're invisible? Why are you invisible? So much you hang out While many in the room say that the voice came from Janet herself, she claimed that it felt as if the voice was coming from behind her. Morris went as far as to tape her mouth shut and fill it with water, and yet, the voice still spoke clearly. Most of the voices that seemed to be coming from something within Janet seemed to be rambling on about nothing for hours at a time. That is, until this ghost named Bill made a shocking confession. When asked if he remembered what had happened when he died, the voice replied, quote, I went blind, then I had a hemorrhage, and I fell asleep, and I died in a chair in the corner downstairs. Months later, Terry Wilkins contacted the family and informed them that his father, Bill Wilkins, lived in the house before the Hodgson family moved in. This voice described the exact circumstances of Bill Wilkins' death. In July of 1978, Janet was admitted to Maudsley Hospital for psychiatric testing. They gave her every possible test that they had available, and after two months, she returned home having passed every test. There was nothing wrong with Janet. Ed and Lorraine Warren made two trips to the house and captured hours of evidence on tape, claiming that they caught objects levitating around rooms and wallpaper being peeled from the walls. They also communicated with the spirit of Bill Wilkins through Janet. In 2016, The Conjuring 2 would tell the true story of what happened in Enfield, and Lorraine Warren would describe the movie as accurate. The hauntings and activity eventually died down, and Peggy continued to live in the house until her death in 2003. In total, 30 people claimed to have witnessed hauntings at the Enfield home. Gross and Playfair logged over 2,000 instances of paranormal activity at the house. Despite many people involved with the case being offered money to debunk the findings about the poltergeist on Green Street, 45 years later, not a single person directly connected with the haunting has changed their story. I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, The Poltergeist of Green Street. Hello. Hello. Just, 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 just
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Hometown Ghost Stories, episode number 48, The Enfield Poltergeist. I'm Jesse Wilkins. I'm joined by Rob Coakley. Hello, Rob. We are mere hours away from it being fall. It's hitting that little crisp in the air just about. We're getting there. Their leaves are about to fall. And we are one day closer to Dave's death. So <laughs> things are going well. I was wondering if there was going to be a Dave joke mix in there. We're also joined by Dave. What's going on? What's going on? Happy fall if you're listening and if you're watching live. Happy last day of summer. That's right. Let me yes. apologize in advance uh, to the people who are watching the YouTube stream for my unbearably thin mustache. My barber got carried away and now my mustache is thin. So with that cleared up, I, I hope that we can continue with our viewership and you guys will forgive me. But I can't uh, believe I how many people have left the stream just after. Just, just because as soon, as soon as I popped up, they're like, oh, God, not enough mustache. Get him out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, I want to thank uh, everyone who's hanging out in live chat. I see Tommy, I see Fox Crown, Catherine, Matthew T, Papa Squatch, the Stephanie's, uh, Sal Chuk and his wife. Thank you guys all for hanging out. And everybody else that's here, of course, is a whole bunch of you today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you guys want to be part of the live stream and join in the live chat and join in the festivities, then we are live every Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So uh, thanks so much. Uh, uh, Andy's here for the first time. He says, play the audio of the demons. Uh, oh, the demos. Um, maybe that's demons. Uh, th that and the audio that before. we. He, oh, has he? Uh, yes. The audio that we played in that was actual recordings of the, um, of this this poltergeist speaking through Janet or whatever. We'll get into the details in a little bit, but that was actual audio recordings from, um, from uh, Gross's um library or from his uh from his actual investigation so it wasn't a quick investigation this was as thorough as you can get they were there i think for 18 months so <laughs> they straight up just came there like yes this will do and they just moved in so um that audio gives me goosebumps every time i hear it too because that voice is terrifying just absolutely terrifying it it's is weird because it's i mean it's, it's not weird that the voice has a cockney accent because all of the people there have cockney accents but it's just it's just weird to hear that from like a obviously from a like a young girl <laughs> yeah right and what's crazy about it though is they had thought maybe because she had these big giant teeth that maybe she was like a skilled ventriloquist or whatever um they're thinking all right well she's making this voice is coming from her she said it was coming from behind her when they first heard it they said it sounded like it was coming from underneath the bed but if she could keep that up and there was like scientific tests done where it showed that it was coming from like uh, like the back of her vocal cords or something along those lines. Um, if she could have done it, which some people can, you could do it for like, like one sentence at a time without having to like hack up a lung basically and uh, clear your throat or whatever. She would do this for hours at a time without drinking water or coughing or having to clear her throat or anything. They were like, it's physically impossible for her to do this consciously and um, physically. It's also so, highly unlikely for a kid that age to be able to continue doing that without breaking character. You right. You know what I mean? For that long. Yeah. So some of it was weird. And I mean, a lot of people were calling it a hoax. We'll get into the specifics of, specifics of that in a little bit. But overall, I mean, just from the sheer number of people that saw this and experienced it, including police, uh, reporters, neighbors, family members, just everyone that was connected with this. And then you also had the SBR and the paranormal investigators to have this sheer number of people, not just believe it, but go there and experience stuff and see, you know, uh, marbles flying, Legos flying, slippers, shoes, uh, furniture being flipped. Like uh, there was like some that was somewhere around, like, I think it was 40 people that claim they saw stuff. And I, I think they've gone back and like uh, confirmed, like on record, I think it was like 18 or 19 of them. So there was just so many people that saw things happening at this house that makes it a, uh, hard to debunk and the debunkers in this 
there's, I've watched a bunch of documentaries on this. I read the book as well. The debunkers in this case really don't have much to go off of. They're, they're basically like, well, you know, you can't really just believe eyewitnesses. It's not strong evidence. Yeah. <laughs> and that's about, and that's about it. <laughs> and so, and then there was also, um, a few other things. We'll get into that a little bit, but we, we could start back from the well, beginning. I, I did want to correct a couple of things. Um, David, let you go one second. So the first thing I wanted to correct was, well, not necessarily correction, but I'm going to add some stuff in because I tried to jam a year and a half of investigations and evidence into a 20 minute episode. So obviously we left a bunch of stuff out, but there was a whole different element of stuff, including ghost sightings, actually, that we didn't get into on the ghost story podcast. But that's why we have this part of the show. But for one, um, it did start with the dresser moving. It also started with the bed shaking. I know that was very much um, shown in in like The Conjuring 2 and, and everyone starts with the bed shaking story. But what I went off of was I found like the earliest documentary that I could find on this thing. And I went off of the family's actual stories c- recounting the events from day one. And in this, they didn't even mention the bed shaking until later. They also would correct a few other things later on. But in the beginning, it was just... Um, the dresser shaking and then moving on their own. Also in the bedroom, I don't think it was actually the, I don't think they had a girl's bedroom and a boy's bedroom, which is a little weird at that age. I figured maybe they would have the girls in one room, the boys in the other. She may have been in there with one of her little brothers. Now the book is confusing. The one I would recommend is this one, which is called uh, This House is Haunted. It was written by Guy Lyon Playfair. And in that one, it was a little confusing because to hide the identity of the family or whatever at the time, he changed all the names in the book. So I'm sitting there trying to piece together who's supposed to be who in the story anyway. So that was a bit of an obstacle to climb over. Sorry, Dave, you're going to make a point. Yeah, like yeah. fucking three hours ago. Yeah, no, we've we've uh, we've moved on from there. So like if you're <laughs> but if you are if you're uh, talking about like the uh, early on ghost sightings, some of the interesting ones that I've found were um, were actually from Ed and Lorraine that were that were. Um, they were talking about the um, the ghost sightings that they had. And one of the more interesting ones that I thought uh, was the girls in particular are coming under episodes of oppression where they take on the features of an old dead woman, according to Peggy, the mother. That was from uh, Ed Warren in the Demonologist book. And then he was saying that um, there was a, a big black mass that would manifest in the middle of the room that would terrify the kids. Also very scary. And... Um, he was talking a lot about the uh, how the most dangerous feature of the possession episodes. So Ed Warren believed this was a demonic possession. Surprise. Mm-hmm. Shocker, right? Um, but he said the most dangerous feature of the possession episodes is that one of the daughters is often caused to attack her mother and attempts to kill her with her bare hands. And that would happen on numerous different occasions, according to Ed. Some, yeah. I, some would say ahead. that Jesse's mustache is the appearance of an old dead woman's. <laughs> I, I lean towards... Um demonic possession as well now it had a lot of characteristics of a poltergeist and with multiple ghost sightings as well as multiple things happening in this house so a lot of this stuff revolved around a poltergeist but a lot of this stuff did things that poltergeists aren't supposed to do for one a poltergeist is supposed to yes move things throw things around the room make knocks make bumps or whatever but they're also not really supposed they typically don't harm people so if it throws something it might throw it near you it might throw it in the opposite direction but it never actually throws it at you people were getting hit with you know we we mentioned marbles and legos they were getting hit with slippers they were getting hit with furniture uh teapots everything it's it's insane the amount of things they documented in in the thousands on like um paranormal happenings inside the house and they they just flat out lost count because so many things would happen like and it wasn't just at night it would happen in the morning dinner plates being broken and everything. So um, and it would happen when Janet was in the house and when Janet wasn't in the house. The main going theory here is that uh, a lot of people thought that Janet was just doing this all for attention and that she was the one faking it. So, Which is a good argument. And what I think, what I kind of lean towards with this one is um, there could have been a possession or a haunting and that could have really happened to Janet. And once she started getting the attention of the police and the press and just the, all the coverage, she might have, you know, fed into it a little bit, you know, amped it up a little bit here and there. I think so. so you, you still got to remember she's an 11 year old girl. Kids like attention and kids also like playing around. So they had caught her red handed a couple of times. Um, but because of how poorly her attempts were at covering it up and how bad she was at lying, 
they were like, there's no way she's like the mastermind of this whole thing. If she's this bad at lying about it, like there was one time and she, it wasn't like she was doing it to keep a, you know, I'll keep up the appearance. She was doing it to actually mess with the guys. They basically, they, they were living at her house for like a year and a half that she was just a kid messing around with them. So it was like, at what point the guy had his tape recorder going on the floor. Um, this was guy lying playfair. So guy puts it down, he presses record and he's just trying to tape what's going on in the room. And you hear on tape, like, let's hide his tape recorder. And she goes and picks it up. And like, you hear her run off and she just hides it under a bed in like the most obvious spot. It took him all of two minutes to find it. And he's like, oh, what's this doing here? And she's like, the ghost moved it. Oh. <laughs> like, it was just a terrible job at at uh, at doing this. So, so was that her faking poltergeist activity? No, it was her just messing with the guy in the house. So because of how how poor her attempts were at covering these things up and lying about it, um, I don't think she could have masterminded this whole thing. It would have taken so many people to collectively work together, including police, reporters, um, the family, the neighbors, these random guys from SPR, like, like it would have taken so many people to work together to be like, hey, let's create a ghost story. And by the way, they made no money off of it. So it was obviously a guy ended up writing, writing a book eventually, but uh, Morris Gross went essentially broke doing this. I mean, he moved a, a, away from his family and his job to go live with this family for a while. He made no money doing this. Obviously the family was broke anyways. And, but they didn't make any money off it. Even like the psychics and, and people that they ended up bringing in, which by the way, check that box psychic mediums came in and made situations a whole lot worse in this scenario. Uh, they also came by free of charge and didn't charge anything. So there was no money being made in all of this, um, in all of this stuff. I think, uh, before we get too far away from the, um, the, uh, the I was just going to see how far Jesse could go. Just, yeah, I, I, wanted, <laughs> I just wanted to see how long he could go. Um, before we get too far away from, uh, the girl, like faking things and play, you know, playing pranks on people and, and basically, when she did do the pranks, she wasn't really good at selling them, right? Like I had the, you know, the tape recorder. Ha! Ah, that's an important contrast between when she's screwing around and when she's not screwing around, right? When when she's not breaking, where she sells it, well, for lack of a better term, sells it. Uh, if she's actually faking it with the throat monster there, <laughs> um, then she's selling it really well. And in other in other situations, um, you know, like hiding the tape recorder, she's not. So. I think that's an important uh, contrast to point out. I think another important detail on this entire thing is what gets glossed over is that this was 18 months and we say 18 months and people will say 18 months, but like you don't really sit there and think like 18 months is a long time. So we're talking about the, the evolution of like the hauntings through the course of a year and a half. So things weren't happening every night. Right. This is what we talk about. Like we go back to places that we've been to um, the house in Bridgewater. All the activity we got there was over the course of honestly for us since 1968. And every night doesn't mean something happened, but you're getting the highlights. You're going to hear about everything that happened throughout the course of a year and a half. So it sounds like so much and there was a lot, but it's not every night so i think that's an important detail to not gloss over is how long they were actually investigating this and kudos to them for having the conviction to stay and keep doing it right yeah so th they were all in on it and the family was uh, was determined to stay in the house and clear this thing out they had the opportunity to move they tried to set them up like listen you're not safe here we're going to move you to another house and the mother was like no no, no. i'm not going anywhere we're going to fix this or whatever so um so one of the sources of the haunting that they believe is, and I didn't mention this in the episode was that um, the two girls that uh, Janet and Margaret, they, they admitted to using a Ouija board uh, beforehand. And they touched on this in the conjuring too. And we did a mm -hmm. review on the conjuring too, but we didn't really go over what was connected to the case and what wasn't. And basically for the first half of that movie, um, a lot of the hauntings and everything were extremely accurate to the story. You had the fireplace scene, you had uh, the girl getting strangled by the curtains, which actually happened. And there's uh, there were some pictures that I included in there. I didn't talk about it, but there was basically like the curtains would twirl up and they would just wrap around her neck and, and start choking her. So they depicted that in the movie. Um, the fireplace flying across the room, that kind of happened in the movie. Um, it got prevented because the pipe never broke. So it, it would have launched across and could have killed someone potentially. But it, this thing was this thing was cemented into the wall. Like this wasn't just like, you know, the front of your fireplace just tipping over. Like it got pulled out from uh, being 
bricked in. Like this mm-hmm. thing was cemented into the wall. So that like they said an adult couldn't do it on their own. Never mind an eleven year old girl. But um, yeah. So they think that. And then we had mentioned the marbles and the Legos a few times. The the weird thing about the marbles was when they would drop, first of all, they'd come from nowhere. They couldn't figure out what direction they were coming, but when they would drop, they would hit the ground and they wouldn't bounce or roll. They would just kind of like stick to the ground. And then when they would pick the marble up and and do it on their own, it would bounce or it would roll away. And no matter how many times they tried to repeat this process, it was strange. Uh, they couldn't, they couldn't repeat it. So, yeah. Um, let's talk about the photos because I don't know about these photos. Like it's, I think it's tough to depict what they're trying to depict in the photos because you're going to just assume she's jumping from the bed. That's right? really, really what it looks like. I, 100% it, I think she was jumping from the bed in that picture. Right. I mean, that's just exactly what it looks like. So, but let's just say she is getting pulled up from the bed. That's what that photo is going to look like anyways. Right. So kind of, I conflated two stories in the episode, which I didn't mean to do. I meant to just quickly, add in the fact that she also allegedly levitated one time. But the other story was she got pulled from the bed, pulled out, pulled down the hallway and thrown down the stairs, which is, I included the audio of that, but those were actually two separate stories. Okay. But, um, but the one of her levitating, they had set up a, um, almost like a motion detection camera where it'll snap a few quick, uh, a few quick pictures. If some kind of motion was detected in the room. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Or if they heard a commotion, I think they could pull a string from downstairs and that would cause the thing to go into a quick burst on photos or something along the lines of technology. I was obviously a lot different back then, but um, <clears throat> they apparently used that. They used that, they used that contraption in the uh, the Conjuring movies, at least the first one with the mm-hmm. motion thing that would snap a picture. Yep. I, I think my only like as I look at the photos, what I'm looking at more so than her is the background and there's two or three different photos and if you look other kids are in the other bed laying down and i need to look at the 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 faces on them again because it almost looks like they have a look of like legitimate terror on their face but i need to study that a little bit more I feel one of the pictures there was an adult who was sitting in a chair who looked who was sitting there like this which is just like i want this uh, the, the look on his face was like, I want this kid to stop jumping on the bed. Right. That's what I got from that picture. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a, it wasn't a look of terror. Like my God, that child is levitating. It was a look of annoyance. Mm. Right. So I think like, this is another aspect that if you believe you can, you can twist it to the fact that, you know, no matter how you take this photo, it's just going to look like she's jumping. Right. I mean, even if she's doing a backflip and she's upside down, you'd be like, well, she's just in the middle of a rotation. That's when they caught the photo. And on the flip side, if you don't believe anything, you're just like, well, yeah, of course she was just jumping on the bed because that's all this photo is. That's kind of that's kind of where these are going to go either way. You can't really establish anything with them is where I'm going with this. But for me, just the the bent knees like that just is a reminder of like when I was a kid, you jump off the bed, you bend your your legs up like that just because you think you're getting higher or whatever. It's just for some reason, that's how you jumped as a child. So that's what, that's what I take away from it. Uh, Catherine, I, Catherine asked if I can overlay the pictures. Um, I don't have them really. I I guess we could Google them. We could probably pull them up. Um, So uh, Rob, why don't you pull up those jumping pictures? If you just Google Enfield poltergeist, it'll pop up. I'll go over some of the early hauntings because these things do progressively get more and more, uh wild so and that's kind of how demonic possessions work or at least the ones that we've covered and looked at they get they start off with like knocks and bangs uh faucets turning on and off and then it advances to like furniture moving around basically what a demon is trying to do is it's trying to break your mind down into a weaker state so that it can take over and possess you so you get yeah. the three stages of uh demonic possession you get the infestation the oppression and then the possession and that's kind of like the um basically the, the advancing things uh happening in the house yeah they progressively get worse this one i mean it, they did start off crazy but and, and that's it so we're talking like within the first week they witnessed bathroom doors opening and closing they started feeling cold spots uh peggy actually started taking notes on uh what paranormal things that she saw as well morris gross told her to do that and uh her first notes were 
were pretty wild. So she noted on the first night, she noted that a kitchen drawer opened about six inches. The door chimes were swinging back and forth and a tablespoon in the kitchen jumped into the air. So she was taking notes on things that she saw as well. And this is stuff without Janet around. So Rob just pulled up the picture. So that's the famous uh, quote unquote levitation picture. And uh, they actually did this. They did a good job in the conjuring two on this as well, because they have them all sitting out around a table or whatever. And they're looking at the pictures and, um, this is the one with the guy. Look at him sitting there. Look, I don't, it might be a guy. It might be a woman, but sitting there like the hand motion. Stop jumping on the bed. No, uh, no. That's, I mean, that's like the mother, but it looks like she might just be like startled. Like, what the hell's going yeah, on? Yeah, startled. The eyebrows look like they're raised. It looks like she's going to sort of like a defensive position to like almost catch her daughter, um, is what I would say with that. The More only so people right now that are going to get this reference is myself, Jesse, and my parents watching. Jesse, this looks like she's doing your impression of the bird that you used to do when you were a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I do get that. Uh, actually, speaking of my dad, bro, bro dad pops and says, I found the freakiest thing in the story was the ghost name was Wilkins. Yes. <laughs> this is another confusing thing about the book is he even changed his name in the book. They called him Watson in the book. I was like, wait a second. Why is there, do that? Are there several names now? I'm confused. Um, yeah, yeah in, so the, in the chat, why don't you uh, let us know if you think that she's jumping or actually levitating, and I'll pull up another one of the photos. Yeah, yep. so let's get so, a poll going. One of the other things that they noticed, which was particularly creepy, was they started noticing the impression like somebody was laying down on a bed, right? So they'd make their bed or whatever, and they would just notice like it would sink in as if somebody was laying on it. And at first it was small, so they thought they were dealing with the ghost of a child. And um, they had pointed out like, oh, look at my pillow. It looks like someone's resting their head on my pillow right now. And um, and that that was kind of a creepy element. And it would actually go further than that. And even when you deal with the tapes, when um, you have Bill Wilkins saying that, like, he's like, where do you sleep? And Bill's like, I sleep on top of Janet, which is a pretty creepy thing to say. But, he's a but he, he clears it up after. Yeah. He's like, that's my bed. And you slept in a child's bed when you were here. I mean, maybe that's where his bed was. But but then that kind of leads into your, when they're seeing the impression on these beds. It's like, all right, Bill Wilkins going to bed. It's kind of creepy. You could see sarcastic Jesse doing these interviews. Like, oh, you, that's your bed? You sleep in a girl's bed? You loser. <laughs> Um, so another source that, that could have been for the haunting. So you had the Ouija board thing. You also had a lot of the furniture in this house. Uh, Peggy acquired it from an auction. The auction was taking place in the neighborhood because this guy, uh, had murdered his daughter and then committed suicide. So they auctioned off his furniture. So of course, Peggy thought this was a good idea to go ahead and buy the furniture from the murder house. So their house was filled with murder furniture. That's really and, similar to the Amityville situation where the Lutzes moved in and used some of the uh, furniture the from the DeFeo furniture. family. And they, these these cases happened like weeks apart to months. Right. That's part of why I think Ed, Ed and Lorraine Warren were late took, a little, to took a little while to get involved, even though it was making national news. Um, we'll get into their involvement in a little bit. So uh, you had the... The furniture and the furniture was there, but it, it, once this these hauntings started, she got rid of that furniture. I guess she's like, "Oh, this is probably creating a haunting," but she never got rid of a set of knives that she bought from the murder house because you know what you should do from a murder house is buy potential murder weapons. Uh, there's another photo of so the, uh, the I just wanted to pull this one up because if we're talking about like levitating, I know this one could still be construed as she's just like jumping herself, but. The body position on this one looks a little more. Um, she looks a like little more creepy. Unnatural. Unnatural. Entering a belly flop. It's a little more unnatural, and and I'm looking at like the kids' reactions from the other bed. So I'm wondering if this is like a full reel of photos because she's wearing the same thing, and I'd like. I wish they had it on video, but um, yeah. So that I just wanted to show this one too. I mean, it still looks like she's just. She video would really jump. help in this video situation. Would really, really help. That would really, yeah. But this body position looks a lot more unnatural. And Correct. That's this is the one that. So if she went from the top and then went to the bent legs, and you know the kids are screaming in this one, it looks a little more real. If you're but listening, she's basically coming off the bed at like a forty-five degree angle, which is just an awkward. Yeah, she's either. That, she's yeah, she's either Arms she's out, kind of like in a crucifixion type pose. Yeah, she's either levitating or falling. She's not standing. Yeah, or reaching out or whatever. It's it's a little more jarring than the other one. For some reason, so like for me, this would be the one 
to use more, but it's always that bent leg one that they show. Yeah. Like anytime you see a, the photo, like it's the one with her legs bent and it's like, yeah, she's just jumping is the way I would construe it. If you just show me the picture with no context where this one, I'd be like, ah, that's a little weird. Why are the kids screaming in the background? Yeah, that's true. So as it went on, uh, Peggy continued to take notes on what she saw. Um, she had seen, um, a small chair by the bed jump. Um, and this was in the morning as she got out of bed, then it, it the, the chair jumped again and then another uh chest of drawers i guess that's what they call dressers out there another chest of drawers jumped and fell over on its side uh, about five minutes after the chair incident she said that cushions went flying off of a chair and a tv flipped over onto the floor another chair in the kitchen fell over as well that same morning and then janet's chair tipped over with her in it at the same time their green sofa fell over and this was all within like 10 minutes of each other. She had timestamps of every single thing that happened. It just seemed like a lot of chaos. So yes, Janet tipping over in her chair could be Janet faking it. But the rest of this stuff, especially with the green sofa tipping over at the exact same time, it's like, how is she orchestrating all of this stuff to happen and, you know, to fool her mother with all that stuff going on at the same time. And this is still like the early hauntings. It gets, it gets crazier, but this is when you get, they actually got their first ghost sighting. So I know we're talking about poltergeists and potential demons, but we also had actual ghost sightings at the house. Uh, the first one was seen by the neighbor who was uh, Vic Nottingham. And he said, quote, it could have been vivid imagination, but I don't think it was. Oh, sorry, I'll do this in British in a British accent. It could have been vivid imagination, but I don't think it was. This ain't it. This ain't it. Let's I went do down that. to my shed uh, and I came back up to the garden to see a vision of the shadow. We're so sorry. <clears throat> Excuse I, me, I'm going to finish without Rob. Uh, the back of the window of their house, it looked to me like an old lady, a gray-haired old lady. All right, welcome back, Rob. Oh, Rob he's gone me. again. No, that's fine. Uh, so his wife also saw the same old lady ghost in the window. Uh, her description matched Vic's exactly. Uh, the only. All right, so I need to apologize real Dude, quick. Dude, I am on a fucking roll here. You're not just going to come in here and fucking ruin things, all right? Shut your mouth. All right, so the only difference was that when his wife saw the ghost, it was in a different window. Um, so we had two ghost sightings of the same old lady ghost with a very thin, pencil-thin mustache. And then the next ghost sighting was by Janet. Uh, she claimed to see the ghost of an old man sitting in the chair in her bedroom. What did she say, though? Did she say, she I saw say the ghost of an old man <laughs> in a <the> chair <laughs> in my bedroom? No, she couldn't say anything, but apparently this ghost put its... Uh, his like hand over her mouth and like, and she said she had like pressure on her chest so she couldn't speak or anything. Kind of like, uh, you get a lot of those like sleep paralysis kind of, um, mm -hmm. conversations. And then her mother also saw an old man ghost, but this was a different one. She thought it was, uh, it resembled Vic Nottingham's father who had recently passed away. And this is kind of where you start to get the, are there multiple ghosts haunting at the same time? Rob is, Rob has resorted to typing in chat. You know, but but the thing is, like, when you pipe in, you don't come with anything useful. You just fucking like, ah, oh, shut up! Like, ah, no, I'm just the one that's pulling everything up radio. and and so the um the establishing being, what's going being on useless going again. On. The multiple ghost theory, I believe, was the Warrens theory. That was the first time I had heard that. So they came in and they said that there are specifically seven, uh, and there are seven inhuman entities, is what they said. So I believe that was their theory. Uh, it could have been. I mean, this was. Uh, I mean, I know I, it was their theory. I don't know if it was uh, a different theory before. But... Could be them taking credit from <laughs> another person's investigation yet again. Um, but this was from this whole timeline is from uh, Guy Lion Playfair's uh, timeline. So from his book. So this was kind of just some some quick notes I took while I was reading through the book, which, by the way, arrived today at nine o'clock in the morning. I'm like, oh. Now it shows up. I ordered this thing like uh, like last week. It was like a prime delivery. It'll be there by tomorrow. And then sure enough, it shows up the morning after I already finished my episode pretty much. So anyways. Um, Bummer. Yeah. But I actually got through half the book this morning. So kids are at school. I can actually get things done these days. That's pretty um, good. It's yeah. a good one for the, uh, for the haunted bookshelf, at least. It is definitely a good one for the haunted bookshelf. So far, it's a good book. Um, and then there was a lot of connections with this one in the Sally House or a lot of similarities anyways. Uh, another one was you had some elemental type situations going on where you had talked about like fires spontaneously combusting. This happened as well uh, in this house, but more frequently it was pools of water that seemed to appear when no one was around. Um, and then they had noticed that they were actually kind of in the shape of a person, 
a person with like its arms and legs out actually almost like that picture of uh janet that we pulled up that we were talking about so there was uh these random pools of water that had no source which had a weird connection with morris gross anyways because originally he had gotten involved because his daughter also named janet died and he was constantly trying to connect with her in the afterlife you see that a lot with the paranormal field as someone's you know, gets into it heavily because someone died that they loved and they're like, oh, I want to figure out a way to connect with them. But after a particularly dry week, there was basically no rain for a whole week. There was a random like pool of water just on his ceiling that his wife pointed out and they couldn't figure out a source of that. And somehow they connected that to maybe the ghost of his daughter. But then you start getting the same thing inside this house over here. And uh, he had tried to loosely connect the hauntings and say that this must be his daughter trying to get a hold of him, but I, I didn't see enough evidence to do that. And that also lays into like the critical part of this where people are skeptical about this haunting, like that he was desperate to find something. And for him to try to connect these two cases seems like an act of desperation. Yeah, it's weird when the investigators go into a haunted house situation, they start investigating this haunted house and they immediately try and make the haunting about themselves. I hate when they do that. I can, I can think it of happens. A, I can think of a show that does that every episode that we will not name. Yes. Yes, this is true. So was, yeah, that, he, was he really trying to do that mostly or was he more so looking for evidence so that he knew that he could find his daughter again? It seemed like at first... No, it seemed like the vast majority of time that he was there, he's just investigating the poltergeist. I just found mm -hmm. that to be a strange connection that he made up later on down the line. It just seemed a little desperate. But because, overall, he seemed authentic. Because I know that one of the people that um, makes like the equipment for like ghost investigations, the reason he got into the field is because one of his children died. So he's looking at making equipment to help communicate with his own child. So... It just sometimes that's your reasoning for getting into something, right? Like there's different reasons why you might start doing a certain activity. And maybe that's just sort of like branching off from it. Maybe he wasn't making it about connecting his daughter per se as much as he's like, well, if I can establish that something's here, maybe there is a way for me to communicate with her elsewhere. Yeah. And you had that's this uh, that SPR, this whole like psych um, society for psychical research they seem to be a very mixed bag of uh, experts where they had half, probably more than half of them were there to debunk it. And then the other half were there to prove its existence. It seemed like you had very few that were down the middle, but they kept showing up to the house and be like, no, nope, nothing's here. This is all the, the kids pulling pranks. And, uh, and they were just going back and forth with it. So it seemed like he was also at the same time, like really just trying to pull hard evidence to prove to the SBR that uh, poltergeists were real and everything. So a lot of these organizations that take themselves very seriously, um, not saying they shouldn't take themselves very seriously, but they will go into one of these cases and the second they see like it feels like a hoax, they're like, we're out. We don't want, we want to be involved. We don't want our name on this, especially if it's just some kid playing pranks, you know? Right. Which is yep. fair to an extent, but like you're also not doing your job as an investigator if you're not there fully. Um, clarifying the situation yeah but i get it like it's also with uh, a similar one was the lindley street case with uh they based the poltergeist movie on um when the girl was basically just they found out that she was faking things half the investigators were like we're out i'm not doing it i don't want you know and, and she was she was the main source of the ghost story mm. as soon as they like they found out that she was faking stuff they're like i'm not doing this so I, I can understand. I, yeah, I, I get that for sure. Um, so things started to like turn darker and started really ramping up when she turned 12. Mm -hmm. uh, so on her 12th birthday, they found out about um, all the furniture. They, they, they came home and all the furniture in the living room had been overturned. An ashtray had shot itself off of a chair and hit the ceiling. Two knives came flying out the kitchen at them. And a miniature bottle of Guinness also came shooting off of a shelf to the center of the room um, in front of like a whole bunch of people. And they happened to have a BBC television director with them at the time so this wasn't just like the family another family's crazy account of what was going on like they actually had they had a big group of people that walk into the house and all of a sudden like as soon as they walk in everything's flying around from different directions too it wasn't like just janet sitting in the kitchen just chucking things out the kitchen like ah, the ghost is here like it was uh yeah the knives is is concerning obviously and um heavier stuff as well so the, i mean they just kept bringing in more and more people 
to witness it. Like for, for Morris, I think it was like, all right, I'm getting all of this stuff. I'm taking pictures when I find something, you know, a chair that's flipped over or a sofa that's tipped over, uh, but still nobody's believing him. So his next thing was, I'm just going to keep bringing in more and more people to see it for themselves. And if you have more and more believers that are more, more and more witnesses that it, it creates more credibility. And uh, it was uh, at this point that there was another kind of weird wrinkle in the story, which was uh, Margaret got like, she, she got like paralyzed on the stairs. So she was halfway down the stairs and she just froze up. And it wasn't like her just standing on the stairs like, Oh, I can't move. She was on one foot. The other one was in the air behind her. Like she was walking around she wasn't holding onto the railing. So it was like a great balancing act. And they came over and they were trying to move her arms and her legs. And she just, she was completely rigor mortis. Like she was just stiff and she was obviously nervous and crying. And then eventually like they, once they picked her up and moved her basically to a new step, then the kind of the trance broke. So Kind of another weird one there. I think that's the only case of someone just kind of freezing in place that I read about. I'm really enjoying that... all of the uh, Monty Python references in the chat right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way I can do it. Uh, but they said that she was basically like defying the laws of gravity in that moment. It just it made no sense. And this is when Margaret started getting more involved as well. So at this point, it was it was like haunting and possessing both of them when they would go to sleep. Like they would have what they called like shared dreams where they would both basically be asleep, but they're both like talking in their sleep, complaining about the same things. It, it was like a real weird connection. And um, they said it was like a triangle. Like it would bounce between like just draining energy from Janet, draining energy from Margaret and even the mother. And they would all just kind of be affected by whatever was haunting this house. I want to talk about the Monty Python references because they're great. I could I could also toss in here that the, um, the levitation photos could actually just be heard doing an impression of silly walks from Monty Python. That's right. That's right. And what would she have sounded like when she was, when she was doing that? <laughs> no, I, I can't. Do that. can't do it. <laughs> um, yeah. And then you got the, the writing one seemed like that was, that seemed like one that could have been completely faked where they leave the notebook in the room. They're like, all right, if you have anything to say, and then of course something's written on it. It also happened to be pulled from, one of Janet's like notebooks, but they had said, uh, um, I've played enough of phasmophobia to know if they write in the notebook, it's 100% real and you should also take that. a demon. And it's usually a demon. Ah, oh, that's part of that evidence. But the, the first message was, uh, I, I had included, I don't know. It was, it was like, I, Oh, I will stay in this house. Do not read, uh, do not read this to anyone or I will retaliate. Um, and we'll then there was some retaliation. Cause we just read it to everyone. Yeah, there was a follow up one, which I thought sounded silly, which is why I didn't include it. So that then in the living room, they find another message that just had the same writing and it said, can I have a tea bag? And I'm like, all right, well, that just seems too silly to include until I did a little follow up reading and context context matters on that, too. Definitely. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's England. There's tea is like their way of life. Thanks, yeah, they're Dave. not they're not playing Fortnite in Thanks. 1977. Um <laughs> So it seemed like a strange message until they found an advertisement from a magazine which showed a strange looking animal with demon like horns. Uh, the animal was drinking a cup of tea, exclaiming tea bags. So this advertisement was like behind a poster that they were taking off the walls and they turned it over and there's this demon drinking tea. And then you have that weird connection with the writing that says, can I have a tea bag? I don't know. Maybe that's a little demonic tie in or whatever. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, kind of a creepy element, though. There was one for all, one further message. I, I forget what it was, though. I want to hear your take on the Warren's involvement. You keep teasing it. Um, so judging off like all the early stuff, like the early documentaries that they did, the early documentaries that covered the case, they don't even mention the Warrens. They don't even mention them in passing, which right. is interesting because they're massive celebrities in this whole field, right? So can they I, didn't really kind of push back a little on this before you get too far. Well, let, let me finish because I'm well, not just saying... on that one point. Is okay. that the Warrens weren't involved. The Warrens were on Amityville, which is why they weren't involved in this case early on. And they didn't come in until after all the other investigations were done. So there was yeah. no like they didn't cross paths to any of these other investigators. So they wouldn't Wait, have been in any of the let me, let me push back on your pushback because this isn't a pushback. You're just telling the next part and making it sound like I didn't know the next part. I already knew that part. Okay. Yeah, he already knew that Bob, part. Bob, you want to push back on the pushback yeah, from the pushback? Yeah, 
I don't know why. I don't know why you have to explain everything like a teabag joke, Dave. No more pushbacks from you, Rob. That didn't go well. That one. Uh, <laughs> oh, fuck. Do. Set <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyways, <laughs> I wanted that back as soon as I, I saw said it. Immediate regret. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, was, it, yeah, I, I read the same stuff was that they didn't get involved until very late, but apparently the evidence that they did capture was pretty cool. I also heard that they showed up completely uninvited, which was not the first time. Um, but the move for the, for the conjuring two to make them out to be heroes in this whole thing, that just wasn't really the story. And that's why I say for the first half of the conjuring two, it was pretty accurate with like the hauntings. Obviously the conjuring, uh, the Enfield had nothing to do with Amityville, that whole connection. But, and once you involve the Warrens, I guess. They were timed in around the same time. Anyways, um, yeah, it just seemed like their their involvement was low. And the one thing that threw me off on this was when they were promoting The Conjuring 2, they did these interviews with uh, the daughters. With the, the daughters, and they met up. They fight, they reunited with the, with the Warrens, and it was the fakest thing ever, and it was like... It was just like, like, oh, it's so good to see you again. And, you know, and they, they did these interviews. And the, in the interviews, there, you have uh, Janet who's saying like, yeah, they were, they really helped us through this. I'm like, I know that's not true. <laughs> that's, you didn't say that ever until The Conjuring 2 was coming out. And you're probably getting a paycheck from it. So that seemed a little silly. Right. So, yeah, they obviously the war. Well, it was the same with the first Conjuring was the Warrens made themselves out to be heroes. And in reality, they got Ed Warren got punched in the face by <laughs> Roger Perrin. Right. Thrown out of his house, but it's Hollywood, you know. It is and it, Captain McSlug says their appearance was unwarranted. Excellent, nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, that that is seems to be the case with the Warrens. Like, well, I don't want to say the Warrens per se. Like, I want to say the actual movies more so. I don't, I don't know how much the Warrens are giving the the writer of these scripts to include them clearly they're making protagonists you can hear our thoughts on all this in our conjuring reviews as well by the way if you want to go watch those reviews of the movies we don't want to dive too deep into the movie and just rehash what we've said already over there yeah like i said it, basically the first half of the movie was pretty tied into the hauntings that actually happened and then once you st but the, there was no none in yeah they the tied the story in, there which... was no Crooked Man Eye Ghost rolling. or whatever it was called, which was God. actually the worst part of that movie. The awful CGI of that whole yeah. part. Yeah, There was no hurricane and people falling out of windows at the end or whatever happened in that movie. So, yeah, the, sec I mean, the movie was good, by the way. We actually liked the movie. Go check out the review. But overall, um, yeah. You got to uh, separate them. You have to separate them. Even though Lorraine, when the movie came out, she's like, yeah, it's pretty much what happened. It's like, mm -hmm. no. no. No, it's not really what happened, Lorraine, but thanks. Right. And then yeah. she was like, well, I don't know. I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the drawings were pretty creepy. That that one that I, I included was not one of the drawings. The drawings are, uh, they went into Maurice Gross's folders or whatever, but they did write about them because this guy, Jack saw, I mean, um, Guy Lyon Playfair, he saw these drawings and he wrote about them and they had, she was drawing them in like a half sleep kind of trance and she was drawing them unbelievably fast. And I don't remember if they included this in the movie or not, but she was kind of like, she wasn't really conscious when she was doing it. Uh, the first drawing that she made was this woman with blood pouring out of her throat and the name Wilkins was written in large letters on the bottom of the page. And she had even splashed uh, red ink to look like blood on the picture. The other, the others of them were all the same theme. There was knives. Um, and then one of them was just the word, uh, was just the word Wilkins written in blood several times over and over all over the page, which sounds like some unbelievable fan art for the Wilkins brothers here. <laughs> I know, right? Um, uh, they were immediately taken from her before she even like woke up out of her trance and handed over to Gross, and she never, um, she never really saw them because she was she wasn't really looking at the page when she drew them, and she never even asked about them or anything. But obviously, that came into play later on when the name Bill Wilkins surfaced. And that's what uh, name she. Have yeah. you guys tried to trace your lineage to them at all? So Wilkins is not our, the name doesn't go back that far. We had uh, relatives from Lithuania come over and change the name a couple generations back to Wilkins just to sound more American. 
Oh, so you guys are liars. Good. Good to know. Yes. It's all yes. been a lie. <laughs> Our uh, last name was actually Vilkicious. Yes. Isn't that more fun? It is more fun. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, well, I, I just like, don't trust anything either of you say now. <laughs> nor should you. <laughs> no, never, never. So at this point, the, the it went more uh, from like, I mean, obviously the poltergeist activity is still going on. It was getting like heavier and crazier too. Fridges moving doors slamming things still flying around the house people getting hit with shoes all this kind of stuff but it really started like deteriorating um janet's health so it started seeming more and more like a um uh, possession and that's where it's like if you talk about what i think this case was overall it seemed more like a demonic pet possession than it did with uh than it did as a poltergeist do you think it could be both do you think it could be multiple entities that's what I the warrants thought yeah that's what I'm saying, because it just seems like there's so much different stuff going on here that it's it's tough the, to... the ghost of Bill Wilkins makes too much sense for it to be a um only a non-human entity in the house. You know what I mean? The guy who died in the chair and the the relative called and confirmed it, you know, that sounds to me like his ghost is there. Well, don't you think that's the most compelling evidence of this entire thing? Yes. Where we have this whole like her talking the ghost talking through her saying how he died and then a family a family member calling and telling telling them that's exactly how he died yeah 100 percent. 1977 how does she have that how would she get that information yeah yeah you know and, I mean? and she had kind of previewed it too by by writing down wilkins in these drawings because this was before they started making those communications let's listen, let's listen back to the uh, audio file real quick i'm not sure which one this is i forgot to say what they are i just named them numbered them all so we'll click and see Hello. No, but that's a creepy one. <laughs> I want you to call out my name. No, that's not it either. Hang on, let's check this one. Why can't Janet sue you? Nope, that's not it either. We'll get there eventually. Here's the floor that died by day. Probably blowing. Then. I had an and not fell asleep and I died in a chair in the corner downstairs. Dude, that is so, so like I get oh, goosebumps Jimmy. every time yeah. I hear that one. That that's coming from a twelve year old girl. Terrifying. So like everything you want to say about like the fuck in me. Wait, did you play that? No. Oh, okay, just started playing. Haunted. It's a haunted oh, great. haunted place over here. Great. <laughs> I didn't even click on it. I'm on the chat pulled up comments. <laughs> I thought you were playing it for a reason. Um, no. So everything that we try to debunk, when you hear that, that's the one where I'm like, oh shit. Right? Like that's that's the scary. That's the scary. The yeah, scariest thing. There was there was the skeptical, so much the skeptical argument is that is that um they say that Janet was the voice that Janet was making was produced by false vocal cords above the larynx and had the phraseology and vocabulary of a child. So apparently that's a thing, but I don't know if it's. I, I don't know. Dude, it's I listened to hemorrhage. Around. Yeah. And using the correct, I didn't even use the correct. I didn't say hemorrhage. I hemorrhage. Oh. No, she did though. She or, did. It oh, did. Oh. I said I had unhemorrhage and that I was uncomfortable saying that. So I did, I said it improperly, I think in the, in the episode. Oh no, no. So you don't, so you, yeah, it would be an hemorrhage. You're the Cockney accent, they wouldn't pronounce the H. I had an hemorrhage. Oh, where'd the end come from, though? I don't know. Well, you, I... when you don't pronounce the H, like for, you'd say, I okay. had an, an history. Oh, an okay, okay. It was an historic event. Right. <clears throat> Glad we're getting into um, how to over here. <laughs> yeah, break down <laughs> the Cockney accent. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for answering your question. That is, yeah. no, that, that's good. I, I said it just because it made me uncomfortable. I'm like, nah, I'm saying a hemorrhage. Because uh, why is everybody so pissed off tonight? What's going on? <laughs> we're you on started this. We're, talk, we're talking about. I the didn't do that. We started having fun and talking in British accents. You made us shut up. I, I like that a little. <laughs> you Zorro, removed us Zorro from the screen. Mustache Jesse is like, really Rob, an Rob angry the person. Fudge Coakley. <laughs> I'm gonna call you Funge going forward. John Waters slash Jesse Wilkins mustache. <laughs> over here it gets real angry yeah so editing this episode i had to go through like a ton of these tapes and it's just it was chilling hearing this stuff like it, it was and it did like you said it was like the 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 vocabulary of a child i disagree like like listening back to a lot of these tapes 
the some of that was some of it was just talking about absolutely nothing but for the rest of it it was it just it sounded like old man ramblings like it it really did and um so i it obviously the voice didn't sound like a kid uh from they had a trained ventriloquist come over the house and he weighed in and it was like no one could keep up that uh no one could keep up that accent for or that voice for so long without damaging their vocal cords never mind hours at a time so the the trained ventriloquist they brought in everybody dude they brought in professionals they brought in ventriloquists at one point they brought in a magician Good. and i don't know why but they brought in a magician to debunk stuff and see if like maybe he could prove why things were flying around he couldn't find anything but all i know is he's really socially awkward so everyone goes to bed and the magician is just standing at the bottom of the stairs just hanging out at the bottom of the stairs so janet gets out of bed and he thinks he caught her like going to go prank or something but she came over and she's just like why are you standing at the bottom of my stairs and he didn't know what to do so he just does a poof and just makes a fireball <laughs> but he does it three times <laughs> poof there's another fireball just because he didn't know how to deal with this situation <laughs> she does a third <laughs> fireball and then eventually she's like all right you're very strange and she just goes back to bed <laughs> I just picture him just like walking in the door, not saying a word, just staring at everybody, just doing card tricks and then walking out of the room. Yeah, dude, this was another thing. And I'm not even I can't even make this shit up. He came to the house and they're like, all right, don't tell them you're a magician. And I guess within like five minutes, he was doing a fucking card trick for the kids. <laughs> he, just couldn't, he just couldn't contain himself. <laughs> fucking asshole can't tell a fireball. magician not to do card tricks yeah. no no i won't but uh hang on one second i just got a poof fire yeah <laughs> jesus oh man yeah it sounds like they definitely went all out for this um so what are your what are your theories do you think it was a hoax do you think it was legit where are you where do you land i am gonna jump in because i like my take on this i think it's not a hoax but i what i think it was i think there's a haunting there and I think that the kids got carried away and they they faked a lot of stuff because they liked the attention. And the two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. You know, right. it's not either a haunting or a hoax. It could be the kids are just being kids. But the house is legitimately haunted by Bill Wilkins and possibly a few demons. Yeah, I got, yeah. I got, I got the same theory. So it's I, I think it was haunted, but I think the kids were for one, they're getting attention from it. Kids love attention. So when they see that everyone, especially adults, are like, oh my God, what's going on? That they were like they were feeding into it a little bit. And I think there was a few pranks. And I think, but overall, I think the majority of it was legitimate. And you saw it with just the straight deterioration of this girl's health. I mean, they checked her into a hospital and everything, actually a few times. But uh mm -hmm. they had her like tested for like psychiatric uh you know, mental problems or whatever. And she came back just fine. And um, yeah, there's too much. There's too many people that confirm this. There's too many witnesses, too many eyewitness accounts uh, from every range of people, professionals, police officers, neighbors, your average Joes, uh, just everybody, magicians. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, so... I, I think somebody asked if she died. She survived that. She was doing interviews up until recently. I had seen in a Google image search that she may have died recently, but maybe not. I know the mother died. I mean, she was old when this thing was happening. So she died in the same chair, didn't she? No, I think that was just a part that the movie made up. I believe she died in the house, but not in the chair. I don't think the movie made it up. I thought that was a fact, but I could be wrong. I think we went over this in the in the podcast, and I think I'm stealing Rob's thunder. I'm pretty sure Rob debunked that it didn't happen in that chair. I'll roll with it. I don't feel like uh, we're going on an hour and a half here, so I'm not going to research it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I, I think if the haunting was real, by the way, like I know that you guys didn't ask me and nobody ever cares about my opinion tonight because everyone's so combative. But yeah, I think it was. Uh, we didn't start. We didn't start this. You started, started this. this. I didn't start anything. I think the, you... there's only one way that we can all get on the same page here. If Rob starts fight, gets his ass kicked and then plays victim. Oh, oh there we go. Oh, <laughs> there's the pirate hats. <laughs> There was no way to talk about them, so just that we still have the hats, so everything's fine. Um, yeah, so we should start going. Anything else you want to add to the Enfeld story right now, though, before we before we move on? Fox Crowns will lose too. Maybe maybe the little bottomobile showed up, and uh, and that's why she ended up just fine. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. 
Is there, is there anything else on this that you wanted to add? I mean, we got pretty in depth on this. We got more in depth on this than I think a lot of people do. To be honest, <clears throat> yeah, we we could have easily done two or three parts on this just mm. because we had a year and a half of evidence. I mean, we just scratched the right. surface. Go right. out there, check out some of the documentaries, uh, read the book. It, it's there's it's it's so much. It's almost it's almost too much. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like we recapped within 15 minutes, there was enough that most people get in their lifetime with too much. I like, I like the idea of too much evidence. I believe this haunting is not real because there is too much evidence. <laughs> it's just too good. Yeah. So, all right, let's, Anyways, what do we let's got next get week? in, let's get into some of the stuff we have coming up because we actually have quite a bit coming up over the next month or two. Um, you want to start with next week? So nobody got the castle last week. We're gonna stay in England next week. Can and you say we are with the accent. I can't do an English accent. See, that's why you're mad, is because you can't have fun with us. I mean, you can't do an English accent either, to be perfectly what? fair. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's fantastic. I just have to do it in a little kid accent. Yeah, you crushed the Oliver Twist accent. <laughs> say, <laughs> say uh please, sir. May I have another? Please, sir, may I have another? There it is. All right. I'm I, said, I said I can't not sound really <laughs> pathetic. Well, that's Please, what, sir, I have another. <laughs> a big old, a big old English bloke. All right, we can we can stop this now. All right, so we are we're gonna I brought, stay. I've in... brought, brought shame to my family. <laughs> we are gonna stay in England next week, and we are gonna do Chillingham Castle, which is when you think of haunted castles, I think a lot of the imagery comes from this place because of the way it looks uh the stories behind it just like a little bit of um what's going on with this castle it originally started out in the late 1200s so that's how far back this castle goes and it's still standing today now there's been renovations and stuff but yeah this this structure we always like oh my god the 1800s here in america was so long ago and now we're doing something from the 1200s. So, yeah. yeah. Andy right, says, I think if the Fresh Prince had a, had a castle, it'd be called Chillingham. <laughs> <laughs> Papa Squatch uh, says, uh, what did I I just got back. What did I miss? Well, what you missed was the reason that we don't shoot this live in the same studio. Because if so, I would have turned Rob around and wheeled him right out of the room while I was trying to do my British accent because he was spoiling all the fun. You missed Rob being a fun spudge earlier. Yeah. Really, really ruined it for the lot of us. Would have witnessed Jesse dislocating both of his shoulders in the process. To... <laughs> Got to get some more WD forties on that gaming chair wheel. It's cursed, so it doesn't wheel as easily. I I want to thank Joanne, who's usually in the chat. I haven't seen her tonight, but she sent us some stories from Australia that were really really good. Um, we've gotten a lot of good stories. Some of the stuff that she sent us was very different than other stuff we get. Uh, I know, Dave, I think you read it as well. Yeah. But, but those were some pretty fun stories, pretty interesting stories. So, yes. yeah, I wanted to thank her. Um, we did. Let's just talk about some of the appearances we're doing as well. We we were on a show called the Legit Paranormal Podcast a couple weeks ago. Uh, we didn't bring that up. We it are last, it was last week, last, last week, or Sunday before last. Yeah, everything's bleeding together for me. Mm -hmm. um, We're going to be on a show called Two Guys on Block Island, which isn't a paranormal podcast, but they want to do a paranormal. But that episode, episode will be that that episode will be. And yeah, so we, we'll be we'll be in Block Island on Saturday. We'll correct. Be going, we'll be live on TikTok from a few different places. When we right. Do that. So forward to that trip. The three of us are actually going to go together for that and um we are going to do chris jericho's podcast again now it's going to be on a topic that you guys have already heard us cover before but it'll be fun to revisit that particular topic i don't want to say what the topic is so was the last one though so right so that was a lot of fun um other than that we have some reviews if you what do you guys have i will go over the patreon real quick if you guys want to pull those up we have our vips we have Justin T, Jimmy H, Stephen V, and Lisa J. They can do our VIPs. Uh, we have uh, our newest is Kerry Lee J. Uh, Jimmy, uh, I already mentioned Jimmy. We have Rachel B, Anthony, Angry Dave Rocks T. You saw all of the, the angry podcast hosts today. Matthew T, Cody G, Sydney B, Mark M, 
uh, Papa Squatch, Mike B, Brandon W, Sarah W, Soph M, Hooper, Jake V, Stephanie A, Captain McSlugs, and Sarah R, and Seth Dave Sucks W gets an honorable mention. <clears throat> Anything uh, oh, got for and- reviews? For Patreon members, we are doing the Hangout again next Tuesday. So 8.15, if you're a $10 Patreon member or up, you can join us for a live chat beforehand for about a half an hour. It's a lot of fun. We have people that you know, ask us pretty informative questions about the show. Also, tell us some of their ghost stories, stuff that they've experienced. It's, it's a good way to like just mingle with the community and hear other people's stories and you don't have to hear us babble the entire time. That's right. But, Ricardo and... asked if those are pistols hanging up over above my right shoulder. Those are 3D printed Mozambiques from Captain McSlugs. If anybody's ever played Apex Legends, that's what that's from. It's a fun, and... word. It's a fun word to say. And I don't think Jesse is going to be able to do this, but I'm pretty positive that in a couple weeks, me and Dave are going to be doing um, a live we're going to be doing a live um, discussion in Bridgewater for a haunted ghost store as like a special guest. I'm not, I, it's not locked in, but I think we're doing that as well. So, so if you're cool. in, if you're in the area and you're close to Bridgewater, Massachusetts, um, there's a whole ghost store that's going to be going on and then we're going to speak afterwards. So the reason economy out is not schedule related. It's just, they saw a picture of my mustache and they're like, no, 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 too thin. I don't, have, yeah. I don't have enough time to grow it back in before the <laughs> tour. So <clears throat> I have no faith in that. Yeah. Friday, we have a uh, movie review of The Privilege uh, going to drop. So if you're not a Patreon member, you'll get that on Friday. If you are a Patreon member, you've already got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a movie that, that we watched. That's what I'll say. It's a movie. Uh-huh. It is a movie. So Lug73 sent in this five-star review that said, awesome and informative. Great show. Thoroughly thoroughly enjoy listening and have learned so much. For instance, in episode 16, I learned baking can be used as a sex tool. Who knew? Thanks, guys. Now you know. <laughs> if you haven't heard the Dave Loves Banking jokes, that's, uh, that's what he's referring to. Right. TJW316 uh, comments as binge-worthy. Recently discovered this show from the Jericho podcast. I love hearing ghost stories and haunting, but I can do without the spirit box audio. Hearing ghost talk back had me terrified. LOL. I love the cursed possessions and the horror movie reviews. I've listened to all of the episodes. All right. All right. We're gonna we're gonna cut Dave out because Dave's, Dave Dave said Dave said fuck that guy's review. Uh, here, here it is. Uh, Dave's Dave's having big connection issues. Yeah. <laughs> he looks very confused. He's like, what did I do? <laughs> yeah, you're completely frozen, Dave. So yeah. Uh Rob, do you have that one in front of you? I do. So I'll reread this. Recently discovered this show from the Jericho podcast. I love hearing ghost stories and hauntings, but I can do without the spirit box audio. Hearing a ghost talk back had me terrified. LOL. I love the cursed possessions and the horror movie reviews. I've listened to all the episodes in like three days. That's a trooper. Can't wait to hear you hear what you guys have coming next. Yes, it looks like we have Dave back here. We're going to mute you, see how that goes. Hello, Dave. Hi, am I back? Kind of, you're blurry. That's all right. We're ending the show anyways. Um, yeah, we have so one more. We have oh, one more. Boom, go. So this one's from Kristen. Um, she said, I'm glad I found this podcast. I listen to this as I, were, as I work remote from home and data entry, which is pretty mind-numbing. As someone who grew up seeing ghosts and hearing stories, I love the spooky narrative and history and general hijinks of the show. Um, I'm going to email you all my stories from Maryland. Another would be Point Lookout Lighthouse and Lord Baltimore Hotel. Keep it up. So yeah, again, anyone that has ghost stories, you can email them us to us at hometownghoststories at gmail.com. Again, like she was saying, she's going to email some of those. The ones from Joanne were fascinating. Other listeners that have sent those in, thank you as well. Very cool. Yeah, appreciate that. And I appreciate everyone who, who stuck around in... Uh... In live chat today. It was a, it was a good, good chunk of people there. So it's a good time. So thank, thank you guys so all for hanging out. And uh, we'll be back on Friday with we're dropping movie review. And then it's yeah. Cursed Possession is the following week. Okay. We'll we'll review for the regular people. The Patreon members will get a Cursed Possession on Friday. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I want to give a big shout out to Irish Assassin. Thank you for bringing in people and, and hosting our stream on his stream. If you guys haven't yet, go follow him on Twitch. He's doing karaoke night tonight, and that sounds like a lot of fun. Mm. And um, Specky, what's up? How are you? All right. I think that'll do it, gentlemen. Uh, anything else? Uh, that's it for me. Very cool. Well, thank you guys for tuning in, and we will uh, catch you next time.
é isso. What's up, everyone? Rob from Hometown Ghost Stories here. Just wanted to thank you for watching this week's episode. Unless you fast forwarded to this part, which would be super weird, you should rewind the whole thing, watch the episode from the beginning, get back to this part so that I can tell you, you should leave a comment below. Let us know what you thought of this place. Also, jump over to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Leave us a comment on that as well. We will read it at the end of the episode like you just heard unless you did that psychopathic thing where you watched this part first. Anyways, timeline's getting all confused. Rate, review, that's what we're looking for. Thanks for joining us here at Hometown Ghost Stories.